Welsh boy comes yes. to Oxford. A lot of posh boys. How was it? It was, um, let me just talk about Doctor Who when I was there. <laughs> it came here in 1981, which was the first season of Peter Davison. And um, in those days, you won't have television, you know, in your phone, there was one television, one television in the college at the bottom of the second staircase on the left. And this is one television. And if you wanted to watch Doctor Who, it was just potluck. It was just, if you went there, and if there was rugby, it was often rugby on BBC Two on Tuesdays at the same time. So you'd sit there, there were like three of us that liked Doctor Who. And, um, and if all the lads arrived, like, like that, um, they'd turn it over. I can remember the awful episodes I missed, awful nights where they'd come in and turn over. There was nothing you could do. You couldn't download it. There was no iPlayer. There was no repeats. That episode was lost. I can remember episodes that I missed. That's what it was like. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my mother had bought a VHS player at home in Swansea, so I did, I did see it. I begged her to. It was like, that's when they were kind of brand new then. And, um, but what was it like, really? It was kind of like, I came from a, a very big comprehensive school in Swansea, 2,300 pupils which was vast, which is way too big for any sensible school. But it had a really, really huge policy of getting people into Oxbridge. And 12 or 13 in our year went, which is a big sum. It's a big sum now. At that right? time, that's it? extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. There was a woman yeah. there called Iris Williams, who um, was the deputy head teacher, who, who had a policy of, of, like, I think she ignored the rest of the school, but she had a policy of, of getting people into Oxford and Cambridge. We had, like, Monday lunchtime classes in how to answer the entrance exam and stuff like that. Um, so there was, you know, if you did well, there was, there was not a pressure, but there was a good system to do that and I automatically. So it was, all, it, was, it was all kind of a little bit automatic. It was all kind of like, I was clever, so yes, I passed that. And I, but then I went, I came here for an interview and I passed that and I passed my A-level. So I didn't come in with any great thought, really. It was kind of like, um, and really, I don't know, if you look back, you're a bit of a twat at 18, really. It's like, I probably just, just... I pro would I have a gap here now? I don't know. I was just, it was just a different one. I was so young. I just came here and did it, really. I, I, I kind of feel like I didn't really become myself particularly till afterwards, till I went and got work and a job. And I had a very nice time here. Did it. you do any work or did you I put did. on plays? And, and you drew cartoons? And I did cartoons really? for Charwell and Isis and I did a lot of acting. I did, I was one of the players. We did Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead. It was the 20th anniversary of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead. And I was, was I Guildenstern or was I Rosencrantz? I can't remember. <laughs> who's, the, who's the more sarcastic one? Guildenstern. Is that right? I can't remember. No, I, I can't remember. <laughs> At the Playhouse, we did that. And, and Tom Stoppard came and saw it. Mm. And um, Tom and Miriam Stoppard came and saw it. Um, so yeah, I did a lot of that. I loved all that. Mm. Um, I had a good time with that kind of stuff. But yes, so yes, I had enormous mm. fun. Yeah. And then, was it straight into television? I mean, you started in children's television, didn't you? So how did you, did I do? how do you get into television? This is what they all I know, know, I know, I know. It was a, do you know what? And I tell you what, I, I was such a television watcher. I used to apply every year for the BBC training scheme. So I applied for two years running for that. Got turned, I didn't get an interview. And I was so cross that I didn't get an interview. Because I watch, and I still do enormous amounts of television. I just, I just love television. It's just ridiculous they get an interview. So I wrote to them a complaint and got a meeting with like the head of Persetwell. It was probably the woman on the desk that day. But <laughs> I thought it was like the head of personnel or something. Because genuinely sitting there and went and saw her in London and complained, saying, I love television, why can't I go? And she was very uh, accepting of that and listened to me and gave me advice and stuff like that. So then I applied for a third time and got turned down again. It's mm -hmm. like, I just it couldn't get into it. But the official training schemes were love nor money. What on earth did they expect of someone? In fairness, then, those schemes were very newsy. You'd go and work mm. on the news and the news, which isn't very me at all. So they saw through me, obviously. That wasn't officially the case, though. You could work on anything. Anyway, so um, I went to Cardiff and I started working in theatre there. I just, you know, wanted to do something creative. I actually, actually kind of worked for the Sherman Theatre in Cardiff. I worked in publicity. I used to draw their posters and things like that. And it's all, and I hate to tell you, it was just luck in the end. Although it's not luck, it's kind of being in the right area. You know, I was working with actors and when you're working in a theatre, it's not like working in a bank in Cardiff, is it? You're in a kind of creative space, a creative space. And um, so then um, it simply happened that someone there, I did a production of A Midsummer Night's Dream there, and the woman who played uh, Mistress Quince in that said, oh, I used to teach someone who now works at the BBC and they're looking for someone to work with um, children. Uh, 50 pounds a day, it was a fortune. I was so overdrawn, it was an absolute fortune. 50 pounds a day, it was a problem called Why Don't You? that everyone knew that you were probably all too young for Why Don't You, but it was it ran for a bit, someone at the back there, yes, great show. And um, it was a real laugh show. 
And I went for the interview. And to be absolutely honest, I think I was the only Welsh person that went for interview. So I, th I think I got the job on that. There was one lad from Leeds and one woman from Scotland. So I think by dint of being Welsh, it was like, oh, we'll have you. And that was it. And then I loved it. That was like in. And then I literally walked into a television studio for the first time in my life. And I was like, oh, I've come home. I just absolutely felt like, wow, I'm home now. This yeah. is where I'm yeah. meant to be. Loved mm. it. And one of the threads running through your work is, is an influence of soap family drama and yeah. one of your early works was a um soap influenced sort of working class catholic family in liverpool wasn't it? oh was right that, that wasn't so much me yes that was partly me yes i had a, a lot of input into that it was a yeah. thing at granada called spring hill it was mad um it was actually created by uh paul abbott's at the moment called frank cultural boyce as well frank cultural boyce, well, just famous frank, frank, frank yeah. cultural boyce now um mm. and paul um Yes, that was a soap opera set in a council estate in Liverpool in which the Antichrist was born in this, in this, in this Catholic family. That was a bit mad, wasn't it? And she sort of had the, the Antichrist had like guardian, a nanny who was the devil guarding her. And another character was an angel come to kill him. All on like the 25 pence budget that you did at Granada. It was a great training ground. I joined yeah. Granada. Because the reason I was thinking about that was precisely that, you know, it's a very distinctive thing about your work is to take a genre like sci fi. But in a sense, bring in another genre. Grand, like, so, yes, yes, yes. Um, I mean, I kind of, in a way, I don't see them as genres, really. It's, it's like, I think it's all one big melting pot. I mean, life doesn't have a genre. You don't wake up today thinking, I'll be, I'll be tragic comic today. And although, actually, most days you do end up being tragic comic. <laughs> Somehow, that's a, that's a good catch-all word. But, you know, it's like you can be having the best laugh of your life and an aeroplane lands on you. And, or it could be the saddest day in the world if someone cracks a joke that makes you laugh. So, um, I, yeah, I don't... Uh, people that, that 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 pisses people off about my work a lot of the time is that is that I jump from being funny to being serious, yeah. and I just I give it no thought whatsoever really none. I just it, it just it just yeah. what it ha automatically happens when I'm writing. So there's no great plan that goes into yeah. that. There's no great thought. Yeah, but it was queer as folk, I guess, that really yes. sort of put you on the map, established you as a distinctive voice, yeah. and even at that time that there wasn't really very much gay drama no on, no gay characters kind of just started having a little couple of cropped up in east enders well east enders had had a good 10 years of, of rather worthy gay characters cropping mm. it was still very rare it's still very rare may i say a prime time television to mm. have unless a gay writers there mm. in your normal prime time nine o'clock slots i'm kind of like mm. i'm just it's the Edinburgh Television Festival in the summer, and I've just uh, given some research done of like, if you take out the soap operas, how many gay people are there in mm. nine o'clock primetime uh, dramas? Because I maintain it's still very, very few. Um, you know, just in supporting roles, and there's like the gay sister, the, the, the gay uncle, and stuff like that. I think it's still very rare. Um, and people think it's very prevalent because of the soaps. But anyway, back then, it was very, very, I'm ignoring people over here. Hello, people over here, I'm facing that way. Um, so then it was. Um, there was very little, and um, which annoyed me. And 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 I was working on a, a program for Granada called The Grand, which was a big old soap opera set in a hotel in the 1920s that wasn't quite working. And I and I created. I got it was, I got very bored of it very early on. Yeah, I could feel it not working. And so in the second series, I knew I knew it wasn't going to come back for a third series. I could tell. And so I just kind of went for it. I kind of thought, well, right, what I want then, it doesn't matter. And so it was, it was one particular episode where I chucked everything out, chucked all the supporting cast, and I just took one of the, one barman who had six lines a week and made him, decided he was gay, and told a story of a gay barman in 1920, which was you know, a very closeted, uh, trapped story after World War I, and, and, and you know, very, um, no language, he had no, no, no venues, no context, no nothing. Um, no, no, no culture, nothing. And um, it was literally a good piece of My writing went like that. It was instantly mm -hmm. better. It was instantly better than every other episode. And caused a bit of fuss in Granada, not because it was gay, but because it chucked out all the support, all the regular cast. This is a show that had Susan Hampshire. You're too young to know Susan Hampshire. We had big stars mm -hmm. like Susan Hampshire and Tim Healy were paid to be in it every week. And I gave them three lines and got rid of them or, or to focus on the barber. So that's why it caused a fuss. The bosses were like, you can't have Susan Hampshire with three lines. She was fine. She was like, oh, yeah, I'll have a week off. Lovely. And um, but also, she loved the script. She said, this is a great script. Of course, you've got to do this. So I also, so it wasn't just gay. It was the fact that I had to fight for it. That kind mm. of, it's one of those things that work where you stick your head above the parapet, actually. Mm. It's when I sort of, you know, you're not planning this at the time. That's when I became known for being who I am. It's when I not mm. only wrote a very personal script, but I sat there and wouldn't let anyone change it. I take notes. I take normal notes. I don't think any note will make the script better. 
But anyone coming in with a note that denies that script being what it is, I just wouldn't have. And I literally sat there. I went to meeting after meeting after meeting um, and just refused to change it, until, more or less until they ran out of time and had to shoot it. And so that, that actually, I, didn't, I wasn't doing that to do myself any good, but as it turns out, that, that did do myself some good. It got noticed. It got noticed mm. by someone who worked at Channel 4 who said, that's good writing, and you defend your writing, and that's good. And um, a woman called Katrina McKenzie, who's brilliant. And um, so then, it's all like, half, half, you know, half your life is working hard, and half your life is just luck, just being in the right mm. time in the right place. In the, because the right time and the right place then was Channel 4 had yeah. been slightly boring with its drama, and Channel 4 was always invented to be a bit radical and a bit new. Mm. So they'd revamped themselves. They had a new head of drama, and Katrina, and they were saying to themselves, we are Channel 4, we should be more radical, we should be more modern, we should be doing voices that aren't heard anywhere else. Therefore, a gay drama fits all those mm. slots. And so they approached me saying, will you write that? And that, that literally changed my life, writing that. Mm. That's when I became that person there, really. Mm. Yeah, no, I mean, a, a, a very important moment, I think, in, in, yeah. in the modern history of television, as well as f f for you. Has anyone seen it at your age? Have you seen Queer as Do you know it? Has anyone seen yeah. it? Yes. Big game out of the back there. Yeah. yeah. So let's... Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> well, let's, let's, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, these, these guys weren't I know. born when a lot of this it's stuff like, was going with, with, with home. Home. It's like an, <laughs> ancient, an ancient right. thing there. We do now, you talk to young gay people and yeah. they go, oh, I've heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of them go, I haven't heard yeah. of that. Yeah. That's, like, that's the next stage. Okay, well, let, let's jump forward to something they might, might have heard of. What, why did they ask you to come along and be the showrunner to revive Doctor Who, which, let's face it, yes. had, uh, everybody thought it had, well past its sell by yes, date till you yes, came yes. along. Um, so it what was, was the story about that? It was partly Doctor Who. I put a Doctor Who fan into Doctor Who and K9, the little robot dog, appeared in one episode because uh, that's quite typical of gay men. They tend to be Doctor Who fans, so it's very... But it, I mean, it was a good Doctor Who fan. He, he wasn't a nerdish wimp. He was, he, he was kind of sexy and cool and, and funny. And um, so it was a different slant to the Doctor Who fan. And, that got, and that, what that kind of did was like just... It just, I didn't plan this, it just linked my name with Doctor Who. So then a woman was head of drama at the BBC called Jane Tranter, who's now a very good friend, but at the time she was just the boss. And, um, and she had loved Doctor Who. She, she doesn't get credited enough for bringing Doctor Who back. She, when she was young at the BBC, she worked as a floor assistant on Doctor Who. She was like, back in the old days, she used to mark out the rehearsal room. She used to mark out the TARDIS with the tape and, and always loved it. She loves, she, she's now making her dark, his, his dark materials for the BBC. She loves science fiction. I can guarantee she's there watching. We swap emails now about watching Star Trek Discovery and stuff like that. She loves it. She's got two little kids and they love science fiction. So she's always into it. So she always loved Doctor Who and she was just vaguely thinking that would be nice. We'd worked on one show together. I'd written an episode of something. So she'd met me and then it was, it, was at a, it was at a party. I don't even go to many parties. It's, I don't, I can't bear television parties. I went to this one that was like, all right. It was in the North. It was celebrating drama in the North. I thought, all right, I can't do that. And, um, and the woman who produces a lot of my stuff, you see there, like, like Nicola Schindler, went up to Jane Tranter and said, you know, Russell's always wanted to do Doctor Who. And it was, it was a, literally a magic moment of Jane hearing that. And I was, Jane tells the story very well. I was right across the room talking to someone. She looked across the room and went, oh my God, that's it, that's it. That'll work, that'll work. We'll give that a go. Him doing that, blah, blah, blah. Isn't that weird? Just at the right place at the right time. It's so strange, isn't it? It's like, what am I adding on to that party? Um, it's weird, isn't it? Um, I think it was still, I didn't think she needed to see me. I think she would still, would still have thought of me, but it just makes a good story. But, um, and that was it. It was as simple as that. It was like, and, th and then a phone call came along, come and meet me, come and do this. And I was full of doubt. I literally thought, for a start, what doesn't get spoken about often is that at the time I was like, and I was still out, I was a freelance writer working for independent companies that make drama. No freelance independent writer goes and works for in-house BBC. It just doesn't happen. It's a, it's a, it, career-wise, it's a backward step. You don't go into the establishment like that. You work out there. And it's the only show that I think would draw people in. Drew Stephen Moffat in after me, and Chris Chibnall, and all that. we then immediately leave, because it's like you're essentially entering a system. It's a big old dinosaur mm. with a lot of red tape. But when the BBC comes together and works together, then it's the most powerful broadcaster in the world. But all its departments, its publicity departments, and the radio stations, and when everything comes together to promote a show like Doctor Who, it becomes a massive thing. So we made it work for us. And um, yeah, look at that. Yeah. Even though we didn't think it would work, it's like we kind of thought we might get one year out of this. And um, you know, and everyone, I had pe people in my career lining up say don't do that I had other jobs lined up that I cancelled I had people like literally 
phoning me up saying, what are you doing that for? It's never going to work. Nicola Schindler, who I work with an awful lot, so she said, you can love it as much as you like. It's never going to love you back. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and, and they were all wrong. Hooray. Brilliant. Chicken and egg question. Your, your first doctor was dark, quite bitter. Yeah. Uh, and Eccleston was perfect for that. Did, did, how did, what was the relationship between reinventing a darker doctor and the casting of Eccleston? Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, it was just to make it real, really, um, because I thought the programme had gathered an awful lot of dust and an awful lot of frock coats and silly props and cap badges and, 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 and flummery, really, and flimflam. And, 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 and it, was, you know, it was 2005, and it was just time to strip that back. You still wanted to have a show that was on at 7 o'clock on a Saturday night. You weren't going to make it the dark 9 o'clock BBC Three version. That, that was still wrong. But you just, you just wanted to attract a great actor and not a celebrity turn. I mean, when, when it was announced, people, all the news, it's, when its return was announced, all the newspapers were saying, well, Paul Daniels could be the doctor. And you go, how, how degraded is this part that people are suggesting, you know, people are, the bookies are offering odds on a magician playing him. <laughs> you might as well have Ali Bongo playing him, another woman before your time. But um, it's, you know, and I took that very, very seriously. This is degraded and this is... This is toxic and it's wrong. You've got to lift it. So you need a great actor. So you need a well-written part, in other words. And also, it's a whole kind of thing of like, he wasn't just dark, because he was enormously entertaining in places. It's, it's like, what, what people don't take into account much is the, diff is the change in, in production. In the old days, it was a studio-based drama with four cameras. So that's like making someone in you know, the proscenium arch. You see people mm. sit there, like you and me. If you're in a television studio with four cameras, you can't do much except... You have to stand in a position, that camera has to have an angle on you, and that camera has to have an angle on you. You can't move much from here, otherwise that lose, you know, that, and there's a third camera with an angle on you. That's a very, very stagey show. So it's a very, very stagey production, so it was stagey. That's, that, 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 that's what it was, that's what it was created as, that it was meant to be. They made some wonderful drama out of that, but automatically the 2005 version would be a single camera. That means it's right in there. I mean, it's right up on you there now. There's no proscenium arch. It's right there. If you ask a question at the back, the camera's right up on there. You at the back, and it's got you know, classy. Every shot is lit. Um, you know, when you've got four cameras, you just turn the lights on because individual shots can't be lit. Now you're talking about a show in which every show is lit. So you're actually talking about a more character-based drama, full stop. No matter who was making it, no matter who was doing it, your camera was going to be in there like that. So you have to write that, I'm not say better, because I love old Doctor Who. It's not better, but it's a different way of writing where it's character first. It's, it's the emotion is to the front. And so then you do start to explore things. Like if you've got a lead character, um, you know, you're not gonna juggle fruit all day long, is it? The Doctor is the one place to go with someone like the Doctor. And so I think the great change, I think the defining difference between, we didn't plan this, I've only realized this, you know, the defining difference between old Doctor Who and new Doctor Who is that new Doctor Who is about the Doctor. It actually never used to be. It used to turn up and have a marvellous time and it was about the monsters and it was about their plans. Of course, it, you know, it was, it was about life being lived as a time traveller. But now it's about him and about his companions. It's actually about their souls on their adventures and how they feel and how they live. And that's, that's, that's not so much the writer. It's, you know, that, that's not a great plan I came into it with. That's simply, that's simply where the camera is. If the camera's right there, then you've got to write for that. You've got to do that. You've got to give that camera substance. It's got, it's got it's fuel for it. Yeah, but what you did do that nobody had done before, and that I think I think turned it into a show for everybody, not just sci-fi fans, mm. was the way you developed the family and the backstory of yeah. the companions, and, and particularly with Rose and Jackie, Rose's mother, and the, <laughs> that 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 Good sense. And that I mean, yeah. that is where some of the soap element is is coming yes. in. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, I mean, I didn't think of it as soap as such because soap. I, I think well, of soap, but no, I know no, what you mean. it's 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 a form of drama. drama. Yes, yeah. it is. It is. It's like kitchen sink drama. We yeah, might, yeah, we, yeah. We might say is, if we were in a like, tutorial about I'm having it. twins and I've been kidnapped. Yes. Um, it was actually, that never happened with, with you know, the, the Doctor's adventures were extraordinary enough. Actually, nothing happened to the Tylers except they just waited for the Doctor's next adventure to come along. Mm. They just stayed where they were. Um, Jackie just stayed where she were until the next thing hit her from the Doctor's life. So it was kind of, that's the opposite of what happens in a soap. If, it was, if it was the soap version would be turning up and like, oh, Jackie's marrying Frank. Yes. And anyway, but, um, but it was, it was, it was, I mean, that's part of like, I mean, again, there's no great, it's, it's not as though I sat at home and went, I know what to do with Doctor Who, I've had a great idea. It's just, that's how I write. That's how I'd write anything. That's how I'd write Jesus. 
It's like I'll be there with Mary. Who's Mary's mother? What does she think of all this? It's like, <laughs> what's going on in your what? You're pregnant? How? It's like, <laughs> it was a bit of a Jewish Mary though, wasn't it? It was like, um, uh, that's simply how I write anything. So if you give me Doctor Who, I have to have the confidence to say, that, you know, it did that with, with gay men. It's like those gay men and queerest folk, they weren't like going, they weren't going to the AIDS clinic and they weren't going on protests saying, they weren't living a political gay life. We were at home with their mothers. What was revolutionary about queerest folk was actually they had jobs and they didn't encounter that much homophobia. It wasn't about that. And it was about their mothers. Their mothers were very powerful presences in it. It's simply how I write things. Whatever you give me, I will come and say, this is where you live, this is where you are. That's how I ground it. And that's, that's how I enjoy writing. That's how I write it well. Uh, it's it give me someone's mother when I'm off. Um, so it, I have to have the confidence to say, if the BBC come to me to write Doctor Who, I have to write the version I would write. Which is, and it does take a deep breath, because you're being given a lot of, you have millions of pounds of public money, and you know, a very valuable property as well, that if, if you don't want to cock it up, because you cock it up for life. If that hadn't worked in 2005, the whole property would have died, I think. So, um, so there is one, but nonetheless, that is, Part of the job, of, that's a huge part of the job of being a writer, is just taking that deep breath and saying, this is me, this is mine, it's not everyone's, I'm here to do what I do best, and I do that best, and so that's what I did. So it was, again, no great, there's no great document I ever handed into the BBC saying, I will have mothers! Um, it's just entirely naturally that it came out that that is how I would write it. And then, of course, it did get even better when David Tennant came along. It, it, fine as Eccleston was for that, for that short time. And, you know, for, for Tom and Ellie, and I'm sure for most of our students, they, they grew up with Tennant as their doctor. So, yeah. so I said to Tom and Ellie that you, you, you were coming, and I said, choose a clip that you think is <laughs> especially characteristic of Russell T's writing. Uh, and they chose that one. And that was one. that a good choice? Dark. <laughs> Dark. I love that. I, that's actually one of my favourite moments, because that's when he's so... He's so, he's so human in that, in that moment. He's so mm. selfish and so angry. I love that because he's not, there's a danger that he could be very wise and very mm. all powerful and also very witty. He does have a great sense of humour. And that's kind of at the end of his life when he's so cross. I mean, what a performance. Well, I was going to say, then, I mean, yeah. you, you were talking about getting the camera in yes. close. And I mean, that's, yeah. that's pretty unforgiving. Uh, yes, that. And you need it? a truly great actor it's to be able tough, to do that's it. It's tough. That music, that's the, that bit of music as he goes to the door and Murray Gold's music goes, da -da 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 -da, like that is just... Everyone's firing at their, at their finest there. Um, but yes, that, that's the example of what I mean. It's, that, it's like, it's, you know, if only in the old days you could have given a scene like that to Tom Baker or to John Pertwee or to any of them, they, they would have had a magnificent time. But it simply wasn't that sort of show. And actually, Doctor Who is rarely that sort of show. It's very rare to allow the Doctor to be selfish like that. And I love that. I love that bit. And it, it has, it's the end of his life. You have to choose your moment. If it was a normal adventure fighting sheep monsters and he, he went off like that, that'd be very odd. You think it has to be at a high climax when all the stakes are raised that actually you can say, what about me? It's not fair to have him saying, it's not fair. I love that. But you also, you, I mean, in a scene like that, you, you, you gave it time. I mean, that, you know, yeah. single scene of, I mean, it was about, about four minutes. And that's there. a long and time that in, in is, Doctor Who, yeah. That is a, is, is a long time. And did yeah. you, did, 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 did you find, um, you know, when you were showing it to the producers and so, and, 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 and so on, um, the, re the rest of the team trying it out, that uh, you, you were completely trusted as to, as to the pace? Because yeah. there's, there's, there's no doubt that the, that's what gives it that kind of three-dimensional quality, those moments where it slows yes. down and you get an interior life. Yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. not just sonic screwdrivers and no, 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 constants. No, exactly. It, it was to be, I mean, that's all, that's... that's that, that's my last episode, isn't it? That's my last episode. If I wasn't being trusted by then, God help. It's like, mm. <laughs> by that time, I'd earned it by then. But, um, and we were all of a like mind. We'd been making it, mm. Phil, the producer, Julie Gardner, the executive producer. And um, who produced that? Nikki, 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 Nikki Wilson produced that. Um, we were of a like mind. That's, that's why we all worked together well, that we agree. But um, by, the, by that stage, no. By the time you got David Tennant, and that's going out on New Year's Day, that went out. It's, it's, it's like, um, there are very rarely arguments about that kind of that kind of stuff. It's 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 yeah. Once you once you once you got a big dramatic scene like that, there was no one saying speed that up. There was no one saying cut that down. Yeah. I mean, it might have been. I bet I bet in the first edit that was even longer because yeah. I look back, I bet it's probably like if that's four minutes long, I bet it was a six minute long version. Mm -hmm. That's who said. I bet, and that's where I would say they go. That's yeah. too much. Actually, cut that yeah. and cut that and cut that. Yeah. I think that's. I think mm -hmm. I can see little trims here and there in that scene, and that's you've still got to keep a pace to it.
Do you have a favourite episode written by you? Oh, no, I can't say that. Can't say Do you know why? I'll tell you why. Because what I always get asked is, what, what episode do you hate? I said, what is it? Fans That's going to be my next question. Fans, <laughs> is there, fans are there. What a question is that? And it's, uh, do you know, I never answer that, partly because it's like people love being in Doctor Who. It means an awful lot to actors being in Doctor Who. Mm. And seriously, because it's a child thing. It's like everyone who appears in Doctor Who, their kids will watch it. Or if they haven't got kids, their nephews and nieces or their neighbours' kids will watch it. And, you know, and all right, not every episode is as good as every other episode. And I, but I always think there's someone who's appeared in an episode and they're so proud of it. And it's their one episode of Doctor Who and their kids are proud of it. And the last thing you want me is to, me to pop up on YouTube and go, oh, that episode's rubbish. I think it really, <laughs> really disappoint people if I did that. I think, you know, it's a good 20, 30 people to whom that episode is everything. And so I'd never, ever say it, never. And actually, I do love them all. I love them all. I think there's something great in every single one. And was it difficult to say goodbye to it, to hand it on? No, it was exhausting. It was, it was right. And it should refresh itself every mm. so often. But I don't, actually, I don't, it reaches the point where I don't care about the programme. I had other things to write. It's mm. far more important to me than, than, than Doctor mm. Who, I'm afraid. Mm. And, and I knew it would be in safe hands. I knew Stephen Moffat would take over. Mm. And, and it's about time. And David was leaving. It needs a new Doctor. So that was all... There was no angst in that whatsoever. Mm. After that, I'm laughing at that set because we turned that set into the biggest party. When all that happened, the, the <laughs> nuclear bolt. What's a nuclear bolt? What does that mean? A bolt? Um, we had the biggest party on that, on that set because well, it was everyone's rap party and David's rap party and uh, Catherine's farewell, Bernard's farewell, everything was great. <laughs> so you've had a wide range of work since. When you came down here, when we gave you an honorary fellowship, you were, you were working Excellent. on that Midsummer Night's Dream, which um, yes. uh, duly came out as really the BBC's kind of showcase for the Shakespeare 400th anniversary. Yes, 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 yes. I met Jonathan um, at a pivotal moment where I came here. But, well, I was going to say, because that was, was interesting, because you, you, you were a bit low about it. It was... Because the budget was a problem, the but you budget turned had fallen it around. Apart. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was, it was, I came here for this honorary fellowship, which is the first time I'd been back in about 25 years or something. It was so lovely to be offered that as a comprehensive schoolboy coming back here. It really meant a lot. It was brilliant. And, but that week, I'd been setting up a Midsummer Night's Dream for BBC. And what, what, just money, wasn't it? Money had fallen mm. through and had seriously fallen through. And it was, and it's very rare for money to fall through to that extent on something's commission. Very rare. And it was actually at a point of like saying, let's not make this. We can't afford to make this. It's going to be so cheap. It'll be terrible. And off I went to Worcester. I, I up here and it was literally a weekend of like, do we save this? And you were absolutely marvellous. And Jonathan gave me like, I've still got that copy of a Midsummer Night's Dream that you gave me. And uh, it's on my desk in Cardiff. And, um, and you said, you've got to make, you I described what we were doing to, with it and, and you were lovely and supportive. So I left Oxford then going, I've got to do it. We've got to do this and went back and I don't think we ever got any more money, but we just, you, you get favours, you get deals, you get discounts, you get people lower their production fees. You do a million things to make the money work. And we made it and I loved that version. I was very yeah. proud no, of it. No, I, I thought it really, and it's, I, I think often, you know, I get asked if I go to schools and stuff, for <laughs> what's, what, what's the best Shakespeare on film yeah. to show to a 12 or 13 year old who's not done Shakespeare? Yeah, and they're yeah, just yeah. absolutely, absolutely Oh, but I think we achieved proper joy in that last five minutes. It's a really hard yeah. thing to achieve on screen, yeah. joy. Although the, the Daily Mail didn't like the lesbian, lesbian kiss of exactly. Titania and Hippolyta, did they? <laughs> Marvellous. My work is done. Your work is done. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, now, on the subject of uh, kisses, we had a, a, a little uh, clip there from a very English scandal. Yes. That was stunningly, stunningly good television. But I, you. I think you said you, you, you were almost surprised as to how successful it was. I was. I think it was like, I think when we were making it, I kind of thought, well, it had Hugh Grant in it and Ben Whishaw. I mean, that's, that's kind of a sign that it's, gonna, it, it's obviously got a certain quality to it. But I, th I think I thought at the time, it's like, it's, it's wood panel rooms, it's people in the 70s, it's, 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 it didn't, you know, Jeremy Thorpe was never prime minister. It would have been twice the scandal if he'd been prime minister or if he'd ever been in the running for prime minister. He wasn't, actually. He was quite, actually, he was quite a low-level politician in his, in his way. And no one died. There was no actual assassination. So I was very much aware of... Um, was it a dog? It was a dog. The dog died. Um, I hate dogs. That's why I agreed to write it. It's like, I can kill a dog. Marvellous. I do hate dogs. And um, I never had a pet. And uh, yeah, so it seemed, I, I thought, there's this lacking all, the, all the, the, the prerequisites of a great Sunday night drama. There's no murder. There, there's only a dog. Um, no one becomes prime minister. No, one's, no one goes to prison. I, 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 it's very odd because... The reason why I was worried about it was it, the, the Jeremy Thorpe scandal is often kind of referred to as the trial of the century. The trial was the big thing, and which is great. And but actually, when I wrote it, of course, the trial isn't the biggest thing in the world. If you've had two hours of drama showing you exactly what happened beforehand, so we kind of got to the third episode, which was the trial, and I thought, oh, this would be easy. And I sat there, and oh my God, there's nothing. There was nothing because actually, actually, 
nothing much happened in the trial apart from everyone saying what happened, which is shocking, but you've done two hours showing that. So it was a drama in which I was convinced it stumbled at the end, but actually, to be honest, I wrote, to be honest, I wrote that well, and I pulled so many tricks out of the bag. I used every trick in the book to make that third episode work of uh, completely invented conversations, kind of completely invented kind of confessions. Uh, as a moment of Norman Scott in court saying, you know, I was vile, I was queer. He never had that moment in court. That's completely invented. And on a program that was fact checked by everyone in the BBC, you have to get everything checked. I literally sat there defying every lawyer. They said, he didn't say this in court. I was going, tough. I just said, I'm tough. Do you want a drama? In which nothing happens at the end? In a drama, of course, you've got to give Norman Scott his moment in court. You can't not have that. And in real life, I'm afraid he just mumbled and stuttered and, and, and kind of fell apart in, in the witness stand. Understandably, because he was under so much, so much stress. So I had to kind of fake it in the last hours. So maybe that's why I felt odd about it. In fact, you know, you shouldn't do that really. You should really get enough drama to what really happened. But I did have to fix it in the last hour. But it worked. It was, I'm very happy. I love it now. That was my, those are my doubts beforehand. Yeah. yeah, I think a lot of us thought it was the best performance of Hugh Grant's life. Did, did well, was he happy with? I mean, how, how did how was it working? How was yes. it working with Hugh? How was it Hugh? I think I think he knows. So good. He, I think he's, he's very he genuine. When you read interviews with him saying, "Oh, I hate acting," and, and I don't think I'm very good. He really means that. That's not a shtick. Mm. Um, he's quite unhappy when he's acting, but he does know fundamentally underneath it all how good he is, and um, and he grabbed that. I mean, that's that's the. That's nothing to do with the script, nothing to do with the director. Actually, that was him grabbing apart, and 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 he had always genuinely been fascinated by Jeremy Thorpe. That's how we got him. Actually, uh, he loved the story, and he's magnificent, isn't he? He's absolutely magnificent, and Ben Whishaw, yeah. very lucky, mm. happy days. Yeah. So coming bang up to date, uh, we're now two episodes into your your, your new series, Years, years and years. years. It's had fantastic reviews. Um, Emma Thompson has. Yes, uh, watching Karay. Uh, Nods. Too, yes. or too busy revising. Too busy fans, revising, but, exactly. So, um, An hour off on Tuesdays. Yeah. Sort of <laughs> Emma Thompson is sort of Katie Hopkins about to become Prime Minister. Yes, sort Emma of, Thompson uh, and Hugh Grant have decided to work with people who were famous 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but t tell us a bit about the, the, the origin of that, because one, once again, it, it's, a, it, it's very much a mixed genre thing, and you're, you're doing an awful lot in it. There's a lot of, lot of yes. plot lines, a lot of characters. It's kind so. of, it's, it's just, I always think television's very removed from the, from the world, from the real world. And, you know, I, I have done an awful lot of vampires and spaceships and, and you know, murders and detectives. That's what, te television is all genre, really, an awful lot, even if it's a rom-com or stuff like that. And I do sit watching television thinking there's nothing of the real world in there. And I love it when they do things like, sometimes, once a year on EastEnders, they'll pull something out of the bag and they'll refer to the general election that's that day or something. And I love those moments. They sizzle, you suddenly think. I remember they did it in the early days of EastEnders where you saw in a general election, oh, what year was the general election, 1983 or something, 84, you saw how everyone voted, you saw you, the realisation that Dirty Den was a conservative voter was a really great moment, he was a Tory, it was like, wow, you know, you, someone thought a pub landlord in the East End would be voting Labour, and that's a very primitive view of what a Labour voter is, of course he's a Tory, look at him, um, and, and, and so I always found that fascinating, I've always loved that. And of course, drama takes so long to get made. It's, it's, it's very divorced. All drama is very divorced from the real world. All of it, even on stage a lot of the time. Because so, it might take a year to write, and then it might take nine months to make. And then off, they'll often sit on a shelf for six months. You might be, something might be three years out of date um, by the time it gets to screen. That's normal. So I just wanted to do something that, that had now in it. And you know, the whole device of, it, it, for those who haven't seen it, it moves forward in time. It starts in May 2019, then whizzes forward five years to 2024, which isn't you know, a futuristic future. It doesn't have flying cars and, and, and monorails and stuff and zip suits and jetpacks. It's, it, it's very much now, but that's the point. It's kind of a metaphor for now. When you watch it, it feels like today. I think it feels like very much like today on screen. And I think it's got a real kind of energy to it. It's got a kind of rebel energy to it that I think is lovely. And, um, and that's what I wanted because I think the world is nuts these days. I mean, you've, you must despair of your future at your age. It's like, I'm sorry we ruined the world for you. We just have. And we have. And I do feel that as part of what my reason wanting to write it. It's like, my God, I'd be furious if I was 18 now. All that Extinction Rebellion stuff, I think is brilliant. All those schools, go on strike, go on strike properly, never go back. It's really, really, really bring the country to a halt. It's like, we're not doing enough. It's, um, so I wanted to write something that's that. And also, it's, its purpose isn't quite clear yet. And you'll see its purpose in episode four which, and I'll, and I'll talk slightly about that now without giving away, but it's like, we're, very, we're actually very safe in this country. It's like, you might, you know, God knows, 
there were some terrible families and some terrible things happened and people go to food banks, but actually, actually in Britain, you're, most of us are kind of all right. We kind of go to bed to sleep in and we don't wake in terror in the night and uh, our lives are fine and we'll mostly probably die of old age if the world keeps going as it is now um, quite comfortably. And actually we are just a thousand miles away from continents in which there is terror and violence and that's completely normal and in which there are massacres and, and, and you know, and, you know, a couple of years ago, that toddler was washed up on a Greek beach and we all went, oh, they said, yeah, we all went, that's terrible. It's the worst thing that's ever happened. It's all going to change. It's all going to change. Nothing changed when that happened. Nothing changed when that child was washed up on the shore. Nothing. In fact, it's got worse. And so mo a lot of the point of um, years and years, and it's getting closer. You know, we put them through, like, nuclear scares. We put them through runs on the bank. But it's like that. Things you might think as, as African problems or you might think of, of middle you Eastern, uh, middle European problems are starting to come closer and closer. Problems of homelessness, problems of refugees, problems that uh, start to actually affect the Lions family. So it's, it's putting mm. British people through the things that we think we're safe from. That's mm. the real intent of the program. You'll mm. see that eventually. Yeah. It's, it's not quite. It's not there at the beginning. You have to take time to build up to that. But they will go through the terrors that people just a thousand miles away go through every day. Oh, it's good, honestly. Stick with it. If you stick with it so far, it's just mild at the moment compared to what's coming up. It's like, wow. Fantastic. And um, what I else think. is coming up for you? Is that, Are you writing something else at the moment? I am. And if you're to, allowed to talk about it. Going back to Swansea now to, uh, to uh, the next one is AIDS in the 1980s for a laugh. <laughs> <It's> like, sorry. <laughs> that's a terrible thing to say. Cut that bit. But um, that's for Channel 4. It is like, it's kind of like, it's, um, you know, it's a great sense of duty I'm approaching that with um, and responsibility because aid stories have been told. We think they've been told. Actually, American stories have been told. We actually haven't. Um, um, you know, the first, the first soap opera, first male gay soap opera character who was HIV positive. Do you know what that was? It was like two years ago. Steve mm -hmm. on Hollyoaks. You'd think it'd be 20 years ago. It's two years ago. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. You think these stories have been done, they haven't been told. Mm -hmm. And the story of like, it's the story of, of three boys, 18 years old, one from the Isle of Wight, one from Wales, one from uh, London, just being 18 years old, going to London in 1981, which is the year uh, a play descended upon them and mm -hmm. um, how they lived their lives set against that background. So it's, 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 it's hopefully going to be very powerful. And, uh, and and not just not just about death. It's not just about dying. It's about the resistance and the fight and the and the joys. But also the joys of being eighteen and living in London. And so that's a big piece of work. And that'll be uh, filming in the autumn. That'll be with you. Maybe this time next year. I think or something. Fantastic. We can't wait. Well, Russell T. Davis, honorary fellow of the college. Thank you so much for talking about the wide range of your work. Thank you. All right. <laughs>